morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you are listening. Thank you so much for making me a part of your day. My name is Lee Parham. You might know me as Lego Lee or Lego Lee 329 from YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Patreon, you name it. I am all over the internet. And this is the Brickology Podcast, the study of small plastic bricks. How is everybody doing today? I sincerely hope you are doing well. I'm pretty sure everybody listening is aware of the circumstances in the world right now with the coronavirus. It is absolutely crazy what's going on, completely unprecedented. And if you're sick, if you have the virus or are feeling ill, just let me know and I'll be praying for you because that's all we can do right now is, you know, just practice social distancing, stay away from people, don't go to any crazy places, don't gather in mass groups or anything. Just take the precautions necessary to try and avoid the disease. And if you actually have the virus, don't go near people, quarantine yourself, work hard to get better and just hope and pray. So it's a crazy time, crazy time in the world. But the one thing, the one or a couple silver linings about this for Brickology and for me is one, my streams have gone up significantly. They have doubled in the past couple of weeks, which is great, which is great. I'm finally looking at my streams and I'm like, hey, you know, people are actually starting to listen to this podcast. It doesn't feel like there's only like four people listening. Like I have over 400 something streams right now, which again, to some people might seem like a very small amount, but to me who, you know, is still fairly new to this podcast game, I'm really happy with that. And if the streams continue to multiply at the rate they're going at currently, I will have a lot, I mean a lot more in a few months. So that is very exciting. And another silver lining about this is a few weeks ago on Brickology, I announced that Brickology was officially moving to a bi-weekly schedule. And the reason for that is because I was finding myself hard pressed to be able to make an episode each week because I was doing other things. Well, now that I'm quarantined and I haven't left the house in a few days and I really don't have anything else to do, Brickology is back to being a weekly show for the time being. Now, once quarantine and all this madness has passed, hopefully in the future, Brickology will probably go back to the bi-weekly schedule, but for right now, during this absolutely insane time period, Brickology will be returning to the weekly schedule, which I'm excited about and I hope you are excited about as well. This is the seventh episode of Brickology. I thought last week's episode went really well and I'm hoping this week's episode is even better. And last week, I wanted to give everybody a topic that was easy to relate to and fun that I thought would be a popular episode because of how awful the time is right now. And I was struggling to think of how to follow that up. I didn't want to do another Star Wars episode too soon. I was like, you know, I've already done two of those. Let's mix it up a bit, and I had a few ideas in mind, but I can't give credit to this idea without actually referencing somebody on Instagram. One of my Instagram followers, one of my buddies now, this guy, his handle is at Lego Mandalorian 501st. Earlier this week, he's like, hey, have you considered doing Lego Indiana Jones? And I was like, you know, not really. I hadn't really thought about that. I have no idea why I hadn't thought about that because I love Indiana Jones and it seems like a very natural topic for me to talk about, but up to this point, I hadn't considered that a p potential topic for an episode of Brickology. And after he said that, I was like, you know what? That's a great topic. That's a fantastic topic. People like Indiana Jones, that'll be a fun one for me to research. It'll be a fun one to talk about. And I think everybody will enjoy it during this quarantined time period. So, th so thank you to Lego Mandalorian 501st for the idea for this episode. I have to give credit where credit is due. It was his idea for an Indiana Jones episode. And that is this week's theme. We're gonna be talking today about Lego Indiana Jones. Now, of course, Brickology is supposed to be an informative thing, and we break down the theme to the smallest minutia, little details. And of course, I can't talk about Indiana Jones Lego sets without talking about the history of the Indiana Jones film series. So this is going to be a brief history. I'm going to try and hit the most important notes without making it 
overly long. So here's my brief history of the Indiana Jones film series. Now, George Lucas, some guy named George Lucas, originally came up with this idea for Indiana Smith, the adventures of Indiana Smith. Keep that in mind. We'll reference that here in just a minute. He had the idea and wrote a script and a story for the adventures of Indiana Smith in the year 1973. Now, obviously, I'm sure you all know who George Lucas is, as for those who don't, for some reason, if you've been living under a rock or something, of course, George Lucas created Star Wars. Now, Star Wars originally came out in 1977, so 73 is four years before Star Wars, and he has this idea for the adventures of Indiana Smith. This is kind of when he was just an up-and-coming director. He'd made THX 1138, and I think American Graffiti had just come out. So George Lucas was kind of on the come up, but he hadn't had his amazing huge break, obviously, with Star Wars quite yet. Now, Star Wars, if you know, the origin of, you know, the inspiration George Lucas got for Star Wars was from these 50s science fiction serial TV shows. That's where George Lucas got the idea for Star Wars. That's what where he kind of formed his inspiration for Star Wars from. And Indiana Jones has the same kind of inspiration. Indiana Jones was inspired by the adventure serials from the 1930s and the 1940s. So the two biggest franchises George Lucas ever came up with were both inspired by these serials from back in the day. Now, the production of Indiana Jones, or I should say Indiana Smith at this time, we're going to reference that here just in a minute because it is a very interesting point to the history of this franchise. The production of Indiana Smith didn't really go anywhere for a few years. In fact, obviously he went on to make Star Wars well before he made Indiana Smith. He made two Star Wars films before the first Indiana Jones movie ever actually came out. But in 77, after Star Wars was released, he was having a conversation conversation with a director known as Steven Spielberg, who you've probably also heard of. These are probably the two most famous filmmakers in the history of time, so it's a you know, pretty dynamic duo, if you will. And he was having a conversation with Spielberg, and Spielberg was fresh off making Jaws, which a lot of people credit Jaws as being like the first ever summer blockbuster movie, and he was also working on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is a science fiction film, and George Lucas and Spielberg were having a conversation, and Spielberg addressed to Lucas that he expressed that he had interest in directing a James Bond film. Now, James Bond movies have been around since the early 60s. It's probably, at this point in time, the most famous movie series of all time. I think that's not a hard thing to say. Obviously, now, Star Wars and others are a little more popular than James Bond, but at this point in time, in the late 70s, James Bond is all the rage. James Bond is the biggest, longest-running, one of the most influential film series at the time. So, it's pretty natural that Steven Spielberg would have interest in directing a James Bond film. Now, if you have followed Steven Spielberg's career, you would know that never ultimately happened because George Lucas was like, hey, instead of doing Bond, I actually have a character for you that he, and I quote, this is actually a quote, it says, I have a character better than James Bond. And George Lucas went on to describe the plot for the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark and said it's like James Bond without the hardware. Kind of a weird description. I'm not really sure if it quite fits Indiana Jones in the way that I would describe it, but what other? It actually worked. Steven Spielberg bought this pitch and he's like, what's his name? And George Lucas is like, Indiana Smith. And Spielberg, being a genius, is like, what about Jones? What? Well, let's get rid of Smith, make it Indiana Jones. And George Lucas, I'm hoping, had a realization that Jones is a lot better and rolls off the tongue a lot better than Indiana Smith. So the name now, Indiana Jones, which we can now finally actually start talking about him as Indiana Jones, instead of having to say Smith over and over again, stuck. And Indiana Jones was kind of born that night. Now, the inspiration for the name Indiana actually comes from George Lucas's dog. He had an Alaskan Malamut that he named Indiana, a big hairy dog that would often ride in the passenger seat of George Lucas's car. If that kind of sounds familiar, that was also the additional um, inspiration for Chewbacca. Obviously, Chewbacca rides in the co-pilot seat in the Millennium Falcon. George Lucas had inspiration for Chewbacca from his car. So this dog, this Alaskan Malamut named Indiana, inspired Indiana Jones and it inspired Chewbacca. I mean, seriously, that is one of the greatest dogs of all time. 
kudos to that dog. That dog is a real hero that no one's ever really talking about. Now, Spielberg was a little reluctant to sign on to this Indiana Jones project at first. He didn't really know what he wanted this to do or what he, his involvement was to be with this series, but Lucas was like, hey, buddy, I got you. You are going to have the reins for an entire trilogy of Indiana Jones films, and I've already got the scripts and stories worked out, so you don't have to worry about that. You can just direct these three movies. You'll have a whole series to direct of these films. And of course, that happened. All in the 1980s, Indiana Jones was one of the biggest series of that decade. The films came out once every four years, kind of a weird thing. Usually films like Star Wars had three years in between at the time, but the Indiana Jones movies came out once every four years. So we can now fast forward to 1981, which coincides with the release for Raiders of the Lost Ark. So Raiders of the Lost Ark, I believe this film got a Best Picture nomination. I mean, it was a cultural phenomenon and it's the first Indiana Jones movie. Now, I'm not going to summarize the entire plot here because that could take hours, but essentially, I mean, it's in the name of the film, Raiders of the Lost Ark. They are looking for the Ark of the Covenant from the Old Testament of the Bible. Of course, the chest with the cherubims on top that house the Ten Commandments, Moses' staff. There's a lot of history there. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail. Look it up if you're interested because there is a lot of interesting stuff about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I feel like Indiana Jones is kind of built around this like biblical tie-in sort of story and the Nazis are always trying to get that biblical power which makes sense obviously you know in a world where the Nazis can find the Ark of the Covenant I feel like the Nazis would want the Ark of the Covenant and all of the potential powers of God that would be inside the Ark of the Covenant and this film I believe it's set like in 1936 and it focuses on Indiana Jones trying to find the Ark of the Covenant while the Nazis are also trying to find the Ark of the Covenant and spoiler alert at the end the Nazis do get the Ark of the Covenant they open it up and they all die and their faces melt off because because God didn't really like the Nazis opening up his Ark and they, you know, kind of flew a little too close to the metaphorical sun and they all died. That That's a horrible plot description for Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I'm assuming if you're watching this, you've probably seen the movie. If you haven't, what the heck are you doing? Go watch the film. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. And of course, Harrison Ford, obviously Han Solo's actor, Harrison Ford, his other most iconic movie role as Indiana Jones. He's incredible in this film, such a charismatic and fun lead, one of the all-time greatest film characters. And that kind of sparks the debate, who's the better character, Han Solo or Indiana Jones? It's insane to me that one actor has two characters, not one, but two characters that iconic. And it seems like it'd be hard to debate against Han Solo, but it's also hard to debate against Indiana Jones. The fact that Harrison Ford portrayed both of those characters so, so well is incredible. Now, fast forward four years later, like I mentioned, the four year break between the Indiana Jones sequels, and we have the quote unquote sequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Temple of Doom. Now, this is actually not a sequel. It's technically a prequel to the first film, although this movie is so disjointed to the first Indiana Jones film. Besides that, the you know protagonist, Indiana Jones, is the main character, there's pretty much nothing else in this movie that matters. Like, it's weird, it's very strange. I'm not entirely sure why the direction of this movie went the way it did. They made this movie that's completely different from the first one. There's no returning characters pretty much besides Indiana himself, and the plot is very, very different, and I don't think quite as fun. I was never a huge fan of Temple of Doom. It's not bad, it's a pretty good movie, it's slightly enjoyable, but when it compared to the first and then the third one that we'll talk about here in just a minute, Temple of Doom, in my opinion, definitely falls a little bit short. Now, one fun thing about this movie is the opening scene takes place at a place called Club Obi-Wan in Shanghai, China. And obviously, Club Obi-Wan is a pretty obvious reference to, you know, Star Wars. And the rest of the film takes place in Indiana, Indiana, no, 
<laughs> I'm sorry. India, that's gonna get confusing. Hopefully I don't have to mention that too much throughout the rest of this episode. It takes place in the country India, where Indiana has to give, has to retrieve a stolen ligman stone to this village and there's craziness ensues. He goes to the Temple of Doom. Somebody rips his heart out. There's like all this weird psychedelic stuff. It's kind of freaky. There's short round and then Willie Scott, who's like the most annoying female character in all of these movies. And there's a minecart chase and then there's a bridge scene. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting movie. I don't love the movie. It's definitely my least favorite of the original trilogy. It's not terrible, but it definitely doesn't hold up quite as well as the other two. Speaking of the other two, the final film in the original Indiana Jones trilogy is The Last Crusade. And again, another four year break. 1989 is when this film came out. And this movie, I feel like this movie returned to the roots. I feel like after the sequel, where everyone's kind of like, wait, this is way different and not exactly what I wanted from an Indiana Jones film. The filmmakers, Spielberg and Lucas, are probably like, okay, um, let's, let's uh, revert back and we're going to do a movie where we're searching after a biblical artifact this time instead of the Ark of the Covenant, it's the Holy Grail. And of course, the Nazis are the bad guys once again. And you know, what better film villains are there than Nazis? You know, obviously the Empire in Star Wars is essentially the Nazis. I'm pretty sure the Nazis are like the basis for some of the all time greatest villains in film history if they're not explicitly Nazis in the film. So it just makes sense. It makes these Indiana Jones movies better. They're set in the 30s. It's just, you know, obviously, if the Nazis could get their hands potentially on the Holy Grail that could make them immortal, I think they would try and get it. Imagine if Adolf Hitler got the Holy Grail. That's a horrifying thing to think about. Now, of course, this film, the, you know, most iconic part of this film is that it also stars Sean Connery as Indiana Jones's father, Henry Jones Sr. And this kind of reverts back to the origins of Indiana Jones when Spielberg said he wanted to direct a James Bond movie. Well, now, 12 years later, after he said that to Lucas, he finally gets to direct a James Bond actor. Uh, now, at the time, I believe Timothy Dalton was James Bond. Roger Moore just ended his run as Bond. Bond, but Spielberg finally, after all these years, you know, he's not making a James Bond movie, but he is directing probably the most iconic Bond actor of all time in Sean Connery. Now, Sean Connery is much older, has the fantastic accent in the movie, and the chemistry between him and Harrison Ford is some of the greatest on-screen father-son chemistry you will ever, ever see in your entire life. So, so fantastic. This is a great film. It's my personal favorite film in the series. This is one of my top 10 favorite movies of all time. I absolutely adore Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. I won't say anything else about it. It's just a phenomenal movie. And if you have not seen it for some reason, all of these movies are on Netflix right now. You're quarantined. You don't have a lot to do. If you're listening to this, you clearly don't have a lot to do. Do yourself a favor and watch the Indiana Jones films, especially one and three. Now, the trilogy ends. And kind of like how the original trilogy of Star Wars ended, it's like, well, Indiana Jones is done. There's no more Indiana Jones movies coming out, right? And actually, even a longer break. Star Wars had a 16-year break between episodes six and one. Indiana Jones had a 19-year break, nearly two decades, 89. Fast forward 19 years later to 2008, and we get the long awaited sequel to The Last Crusade with the fourth Indiana Jones film, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Now, I honestly could record a three hour long podcast just ranting about this stupid movie. I seriously could. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is such a frustrating and weird film. After 19 years, kind of like Star Wars or The Hobbit and a lot of movie series, the long awaited sequel or prequel is just a tremendous let down. I feel like this just happens over and over again with films. Now, there were some great ideas in this movie. It's set in the 1950s. Obviously, Indiana Jones is now in his mid-60s. It's set in the 50s. He's an old, kind of ruffled Indiana Jones who's not quite as fast as he used to be. And instead of the Nazis, obviously the Nazis didn't exist after World War II. He's fighting the Russians, you know, which I think is kind of the natural progression of things. Instead of the Nazis, now we have the Russians. That 
makes sense, or the Soviets is probably the better, you know, use. And they're searching after an interesting artifact. Not biblical, but it's still a fairly interesting one. It's the Crystal Skull. It takes place in South America, which, besides the opening scene for the original Indiana Jones film, South America was a relatively untapped, you know, landmark for Indiana Jones to explore. So that's all cool. And then, of course, he teams up with Mutt Williams, played by Shia LaBeouf, who is the son of Indiana Jones, which, you know, is a pretty typical movie trope where you have the older main character now teams up with his son. And it's the son from Marion, who I don't think I mentioned earlier, but Marion is the love interest of Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Really fun little tidbit about Marion in this movie. Karen Allen, the actress that plays Marion, played Marion in the original Raiders of the Lost Ark film. Her career after this really didn't do well. I think she was like in Animal House in 82, and then besides that, her career took a pretty steep nosedive, and she was actually working as a parking lot attendant, I believe is the story, when she got the call to return for the sequel of Indiana Jones. So this film probably helped her out a good deal, but it's kind of sad and just a very bizarre story that Karen Allen was a parking lot attendant after starring in Indiana Jones a few decades prior. Now, obviously, Keaton of the Crystal Skull is a universally just not super well-liked movie. I don't think the movie on the whole is awful. There are definitely some good parts, but there's also a lot of terrible parts. And spoiler alert, the ending kind of crosses over the inspirations of George Lucas's career. Obviously, I mentioned that Indiana Jones was inspired by the 30s and 40s adventure serials, and Star Wars was inspired by the 50s alien sci-fi serials. Well, for some reason, George Lucas wanted to pay homage to those aforementioned, the latter mentioned, sci-fi alien serials in his adventure serials homage, combining his two biggest inspirations in life, and thus, giving us an ending where the Crystal Skull is actually aliens in this movie. I remember being in the theater. I mean, it was 2008, so I was 11 years old, and I was in the theater watching this movie, and I liked the movie for the most part, and then the ending happens and there's aliens, and even at 11, I was able to recognize that that was the dumbest ending they could have possibly done. Like, the one thing I never wanted to see in Indiana Jones was freaking aliens and for some reason they went there which was very unfortunate and it completely ruins the movie it's such a dumb 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 ending i'm not going to say anything more about that because i could rant for so long about parts of this film especially the alien reveal but I'm not going to do it because that'd just be a waste of your time. And this is Brickology. It's not Indiana Jones-ology. We have to get talking about the Lego sets now. So that was your brief history of Indiana Jones. I definitely could have done, gotten to a lot more detail. But I hope that was informative and that should help set the stage for now the Lego history that we're about to talk about. So unlike a lot of themes we've talked about here on Brickology, there really aren't too many Indiana Jones sets. In total, there are eight. 18 Indiana Jones sets ever made. One of them was a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive set of a Jeep, and then there was one was part of the LEGO Brickmaster program that was also a Jeep. We're not really going to talk much about those two sets because they're not really specific scenes from the movies, so we're only going to focus on the 16 main boxed sets from these films. And there also was a video game based off of these, a LEGO Indiana Jones video game, which was super fun. Now, kind of like the Toy Story episode, I did a Toy Story episode a few weeks ago, and the Toy Story episode, I mentioned that they were making sets for Toy Story 3 in the summer of 2010. 10, but kind of as a precursor, before they released those sets, they made a wave of sets based off the original two Toy Story films in the winter. They did a similar thing for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, but Indiana Jones was one of the first examples of this. So they were going to release a big spring wave of Indiana Jones sets to coincide with the release of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull in May of 2008. But in winter of 2008, they had a small wave Indiana Jones sets based off the original three trilogy Indiana Jones films. Now, that first wave was only four sets. There were zero sets based off the Temple of Doom, which wasn't really a big letdown to me at the time because I wasn't a huge Temple of Doom fan. There were three sets based off Raiders of the Lost Ark, so a lot of love 
for Raiders, and then one set based off The Last Crusade. Now, The Last Crusade set, speaking of that, was actually the smallest set of this wave. It was Indiana Jones Motorcycle Chase, a $10 set from The Last Crusade that included a motorcycle with a sidecar build, which was a super cool little build that had Indiana Jones and Henry Jones Sr. It also had an additional motorcycle with a Nazi quote unquote Nazi. We'll talk more about why I'm adding the air quotes there for Nazis in just a bit. Also on another motorcycle chasing them and there's a small gate to burst through to re reenact the iconic scene from the film. This was a fabulous $10 set. It's an iconic scene. You get an iconic character and you also get Sean Connery's first ever Lego figure. I mean, seriously, this was a great $10 set. I can't think of anything better to do for $10 than this set. Amazing set. For 20 bucks, we had Indiana Jones and the Lost Tomb. This recreated the scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones and Marion go into the tomb in Egypt to recover the Ark of the Covenant. It has Anubis statues, which last week I mentioned that I just love Egyptian mythology, so something like this is definitely right up my alley. It had a brick-built Ark of the Covenant, which was a super cool design. It had some cool little small details, and it had very shiny gold pieces. It had a bunch of snakes, of course, to reenact Indiana Jones' hatred of snakes, and it's a set that I never got. I hate saying that, but I never got this set. This is like one of my bigger regrets, because it's a $20 set. You know, it's one thing to regret not getting a $100 set, but not getting a $20 set is just sad. I really wish I had this set, and it's going for a lot more on eBay now, and it's very sad that I never got this set. Hopefully someday I will be able to pick it up for a decent price, but as it stands right now, I don't have this set, and I really wish I did. I had every other set from this first wave as well, and it's kind of confusing to me why I just never got that set. Now, the $30 set from this wave was called The Race for the Stolen Treasure. Kind of a weird name. This is a very iconic scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's that iconic moment where Indiana Jones has his whip and he's being dragged along by the Nazi's vehicle. Now, the Nazi car here, the truck, is a very cool vehicle. It has a nice cloth back piece. And the stolen treasure is a kind of shiny metallic gold treasure chest with some jewels and coins and stuff inside. It should be the Ark of the Covenant. I'm not really sure why this set doesn't include the Ark of the Covenant when it does come the last set. Like, it's not like Lego was afraid to, you know, make a biblical reference with the Ark of the Covenant, but for some reason they just didn't include it with this set. Very strange. I'm not entirely sure the reasoning behind that. We'll probably never quite know. It is not quite accurate, but for the most part it is. You get two really nice Nazi vehicles, Indiana Jones on a horse. Now, Something I just mentioned, aforementioned, the Nazis in these sets, I call them Nazis, Lego just called them like soldiers or something, because Lego is very anti-war. I've mentioned this on Brickology multiple times. They hate war, they hate everything to do with war, they want nothing to be referenced with war in anything they ever make. So these Nazi vehicles, these Nazi minifigures, they, they look a good bit like what you would expect, but not quite. They're not quite the level of detail of a normal Lego figure because they're Nazis and Lego doesn't like war. Lego ain't gonna plop swastikas and Nazi insignia all over their sets and figures. So none of these things are actually referenced as Nazi stuff. They are, obviously, and anyone who's buying them probably knows that, but Lego themselves decides to withhold the Nazi insignia and logos from these sets. Now, the biggest set from the first wave of Nia Jones was the $60 set, the Temple Escape, which recreated the opening scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he retrieves a golden statue from a temple in Peru. And of course, it has a ball rolling play feature. It came with a very odd ball piece. It was almost like a ping pong ball. It was a really cool set. It was a great display piece. And I think even a better play set, I had this set. And I think this, I just have great memories of playing with this set. You know, not too many Lego sets I have memories of being like, wow, I love playing with this set, but this set was so, so much fun to play with. It also included a small plane build to escape, and it had a minifigure of Alfred Molina's very small part in the first film. And just a fun tidbit, Alfred Molina, you might not recognize that name, but he played Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2, fantastic villain in that film, and he's also in the movie Prince of Persia. Alfred Molina was, I believe, the first ever actor to have three live action characters he played 
in Lego form. There have since been actors to join that club, but Alfred Molina was the first, which is just so random and funny that he was part of that club because, you know, you would think it'd be a more famous actor, but Alfred Molina, in fact, was the first ever live action three Lego fig club member. And I would probably say of all the Indiana Jones sets that I purchased myself, the Temple Escape from Raiders of the Lost Ark in this wave is probably my favorite. I just remember this set being insanely fun. I love this set, recreates an iconic scene, and the ball rolling play feature is unlike anything you'll ever see in another LEGO set. So that's just a truly fantastic set. Now, we have the original wave out of the way. We can talk about the second wave, the spring 2008 wave, that's entirely dedicated to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, of, cor of course, coincide with the release of the new film. The $10 set from this wave was called Jungle Duel. It had a very nice cloth tent piece, little campsite stuff. It included Indiana Jones, Mutt Williams, and the main villain of the film, Irina Spalko, played by Kate Blanchett. This was Kate Blanchett's first ever Lego figure, and like Alfred Molina, she is now a part Part of the three minifigure club because of Hela and Gladriel from Lord of the Rings. So she has three live action Lego figures as well, which is just kind of funny to think about. But this set here was $10. It had, I think, about 90 pieces, a really nice cloth tent piece. And this set had three of the main characters of the film in one set for 10 bucks. You do not see that from Lego nowadays. They always love to disperse the main characters of the film throughout their sets and try to make them as hard as possible to get. But this set did not do that. It did the opposite. It made it a very good deal and a very easy way to get the main figures, which I think is pretty legit. I think this is a very underappreciated set for that reason. For $20, we had the River Chase, which included Indiana Jones, Marion, the older version of Marion, and some Russian soldiers. And again, like the Nazi soldiers, these Russian soldiers are unmarked. They have different color uniforms. You know who they're supposed to be, but they're just, again, just generic soldiers. They're not Russians. They're not a member of the Soviet Union or anything of that sort. They are completely unmarked. This riverboat chase included a duck boat, a smaller boat, and a tree that could launch a net. Kind of a weird set, but the duck boat build was pretty cool and actually pretty accurate to the scene from the film. For $40 from the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull Wave, we got the Jungle Cutter, which was this vehicle that had brand new saw blade pieces that could cut down trees that were actually included with the set to make way, make a little path for the Russians' vehicles. This scene, the movie, is like three seconds long. You see the Jungle Cutter cutting down some trees and then you like never see it again. It's completely meaningless in the film and super random, so I'm kind of surprised LEGO actually made a set of this, but it's a pretty cool and very unique vehicle and it had Indiana Jones and it had, I think, five minifigures. It was a very cool vehicle. It introduced, introduced some cool pieces and had a lot of dark green pieces. So while a very random set for them to make, it was a super cool and very unique vehicle for them to make in this wave. Jumping forward to the $80 and biggest set from this wave, it was the Temple of the Crystal Skull. And this is the biggest Indiana Jones set ever in terms of piece count. It has over 900 pieces. And this, of course, reenacts the famous final scene from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. You have the weird, like, opening door monument part, the things that swing out. There was a cool play feature with that. And then, of course, you had the Crystal Skull Room that had a spinning around play feature to reenact the scene where they, you know, form together to make the alien. Now, this set had no references to the actual alien parts of that film. Thank God. Lego didn't actually include like a flying saucer with this. I'm assuming they weren't allowed to because of spoilers for the movie at the time. They didn't do that which is good, but it was a big set. It was a pretty good looking set. It had some good play features, cool vehicles, lots of minifigures, and it also had a giant base plate. Lego used to use these huge customized base plate pieces to make big play sets like this. They don't do that anymore. It's been a long time since they've included one of those with a set, but this one in particular had a very large base plate piece, and it's a very good looking set despite being a pretty awful scene from the film. Now, there was one more set from this wave that was actually a Toys R Us exclusive. It was called Peril in Peru. It was $50. It had a lot of the aforementioned minifigures we've already talked about. I don't think there were any exclusive characters in this set, but it was a very nice airplane. It was a really nice looking old 1950s style commercial airplane. And I think just looked fantastic. It was a great looking airplane build. And I actually got this set and I loved this set. It was a great, great set that I think you could remove 
removed from the context of the movie and still love the set. It wasn't really an iconic scene from the movie being portrayed or anything, but it was just a great build. It was a great deal. It had over 600 pieces for 50 bucks, lots of main characters, and a truly spectacular airplane build with little airport vehicles and buggies on the side as well. Absolutely wonderful set. I loved that set. Now, let's jump forward a year to the year 2009 because Indiana Jones continues into 2009 and we get our third wave, the winter 2009 wave, which is a small wave, a very, very small wave. This wave was just two sets, just two sets. We had the $30 Shanghai Chase, which is kind of similar to the Treasure Chase that we've already mentioned a few minutes ago. It was a $30 set, it had two vehicles, you had five minifigures, you got Indiana Jones in a white tux from Club Obi-Wan, Willie Scott, and Short Round, and of course, you've probably already noticed this was the first ever Temple of Doom set. They only made two sets ever, from the Temple of Doom, this is the first time they made any Temple of Doom sets. It's based off the opening scene from the Temple of Doom right after Indiana Jones leaves the aforementioned Club Obi-Wan in his tuxedo, so you had an exclusive variant of Indiana in this. And you also had the gangsters chasing them with their black car. Really cool build, two great car builds. The Indiana Jones car build had a nice cloth roof piece. This is a great set. It's not, you know, my favorite movie, but it's a good scene in the movie, and it's a fantastic representation of that scene, and five minifigures is very very generous. The other set from this third wave was a $50 set based off Raiders of the Lost Ark. This was the F Fight on the Flying Wing, kind of hard name to say. $50 set, and this is that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones is battling that huge shirtless mechanic guy. This guy is absolutely huge, and they're having a pretty intense kind of boxing match on top of the flying wing airplane while Marion is trying to shoot up some people. It's a really cool vehicle, really huge vehicle. Use that massive Lego City airplane piece. I mean, seriously, it's a gigantic Lego piece. It used that piece with a lot of stickers on it, but again, this vehicle had no Nazi insignia. They actually kind of changed the color up just a bit to make it a little bit more quote-unquote kid-friendly, which I think is pretty interesting. It also included a tanker truck that had an exploding play feature because it does explode in the film. They did not include a play feature of how the mechanic dies. In the movie, he gets sucked into the rotor of the airplane and becomes chunks, which is kind of funny to think about and also pretty horrific. I understand why LEGO wouldn't recreate that in their set, but it's a cool set. It's a really nice set. It's a big set. It was a gigantic build, one of the bigger airplanes LEGO has ever made. It used the Jedi Interceptor cockpit piece with a unique print on it, which I thought was pretty cool. And also the back cockpit piece was the Jedi Starfighter cockpit piece. So both the Jedi Starfighter and Jedi Interceptor cockpit pieces are being used for this Indiana Jones airplane, just to further connections between Indiana Jones and Star Wars, even in Lego form. And this set, kind of to my surprise, I was a little surprised at this. My Instagram followers voted this as the best Indiana Jones set. I think it is one of the best Indiana Jones sets. It's a great set. I was a little surprised that it was the one that, like, actually an overwhelming amount of people were like, yeah, that's my favorite set, the Flying Wing. That's the best Indiana Jones set. A lot of people said that. I, I was pretty surprised. I was pleasantly surprised to see that that one won the best Indiana Jones set of all time from my followers. I was kind of expecting, you know, maybe the Temple one or the Temple of Doom set or something like that to win. But nope, this set won, which was really the first time that I was shocked by the result of what set won the best set of a particular theme. For the first time in Brickology for that. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So that Wave of Indiana Jones sets, very small, just two sets, and that summer we had our final Indiana Jones Wave. Five Indiana Jones sets were released, and each movie got at least one set, with The Last Crusade getting two sets. But the first set, the $10 set, which Indiana Jones has already had some great $10 sets, and this just adds to that list. It was the Ambush in Cairo. Now technically it was actually an $11 set. Kind of a weird, funky price, but that's kind of besides the point. It's essentially a $10 set. Ambush in Cairo had, had Marion and Indiana Jones, and this recreates the scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark where that guy has a huge scimitar sword and he's twirling it around. He's about to kill Indiana Jones, and Indiana just pulls out his gun and shoots him because that guy brought a sword to a gunfight. A hilarious scene, an iconic moment from the first Indiana Jones movie being recreated in a small and fun Lego set that also included a big barrel piece for Marion to hide in and some small Egyptian street stand builds. Very good. $10 set. For $20, the most forgettable set from this wave was the Chachilla Cemetery Battle. This is based off Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
kind of weird. I kind of think it's weird that they actually made this set because this came out a year after Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the movie had come out, and it surprises me that Lego was like, let's make another Crystal Skull set because, you know, people didn't really like that movie, and I'm kind of surprised Lego even made another Crystal Skull set after the movie initially came out. It was a $20 set, had Mutt Williams' motorcycle, Indiana Jones, and it had a couple of the guys with the blow darts, although those are just uh, blank lightsaber blade pieces and brown. Pretty lame set. It did come with a Conquistador skeleton and it was, the, I believe, the cheapest way to ever get the Crystal Skull piece. But all in all, I think this set is kind of underwhelming. It just wasn't a great set at all. Definitely the most forgettable set from this last wave of Indiana Jones sets. For $40, we had the Venice Canal Chase. Now this is an iconic scene from The Last Crusade. It's a $40 set. It had Indiana Jones and Elsa, the love interest from that film, finally kind of completing our collection of love interest minifigures. It had two boats that had cool play features where you could actually explode them and break them in half. It also had a nice bridge build from Venice to kind of have, you know, add to the scenery of the chase scene. And it also even had the thugs with fezes on. This is the first set to introduce the Lego fez piece that is still being used today for fun details like the engines on the mini model of a space shuttle in the Lego Ideas International Space Station set. I mean, seriously, this set introduced a very useful piece. It was a great scene, one of my favorite scenes from my favorite Indiana Jones film. I got this set day one. I remember I was so hyped when it came out. This is a fantastic set, one of my personal favorite Indiana Jones sets. One set that I really wish I got, but I didn't, was the $50 set, the Fighter Plane Attack. This was also, of course, based off The Last Crusade, making this the only movie in this five set wave to get two different sets. And this included the biplane that Indiana Jones and his dad, Henry Jones Sr., are flying. Indiana Jones is flying, and of course, Henry Jones is using the gunner placement at the back. It also included a loose representation of a Nazi Messerschmitt, which is the fighter plane the Nazis used in World War II. Again, no insignia. It wasn't, you know, marked Nazi or anything, but it, they actually did a pretty good job of making it look like a Master Schmidt, and I'm sure a lot of World War II fans were extremely excited to get this particular vehicle in an official Lego form. Great set, of course, this scene. Again, I keep using this word, iconic, but there are seriously so many iconic moments from Indiana Jones, and this set represents one of the most iconic scenes from The Last Crusade. Represents that fighter plane scene. I wish they somehow had included a blimp, but that would have made this set like hundreds of dollars more. Great set, great scene. It's a set that I really regret not getting today. And finally, another set that I regret, 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 that's not a word, regret not getting is the Temple of Doom. This was a $90 set from this way, making it the most expensive Indiana Jones set ever. And it's also the biggest just in terms of size. However, it had like 200 less pieces than the aforementioned Kingdom of the Crystal Skull Temple set. This set is pretty epic. I don't love the movie, but it recreates, I think, the most memorable moment from the film, which is the minecart chase. It has a giant track of minecart pieces, which is super cool, and I'm sure so, so much fun to play with. It looks great on display. It's huge. I really wish I got this set, and this set is incredibly expensive online these days. So I'm probably never going to get this set unless I just find it for a great deal. And I kind of thought this set might have won the vote for the best Indiana Jones set. It didn't. The Flying Wing set still won. But I kind of thought this one might win. And I think if I had it, it would probably be my favorite Indiana Jones set. I just didn't prioritize the Temple of Doom sets back in the day as much as I did sets on The Last Crusade or Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I unfortunately never got this set. I really wish I did. And unfortunately, all of my Lego Indiana Jones sets are completely destroyed. Not a single one is still built. I was 11 and 12 years old when these sets came out. It's very sad, very, very sad that I just don't have any of them built anymore. I wish I did because I would have an epic Indiana Jones display. Maybe someday I'll rebuild them or rebuy the sets. But as it stands right now, my Indiana Jones collection is destroyed, albeit a pretty sizable size collection. I really wish I still had those sets built. So there you have it. That is Lego Indiana Jones. I really hope you guys had a fun time listening to this week's episode of Brickology. I sure had a fun time researching this episode. This was certainly a fun time 
topic, and it's all thanks to LEGO Mandalorian 501st from Instagram for submitting this topic. And if you think you have a good topic for Brickology, please let me know. Shoot me a message on Instagram or email me at legolead329 at gmail.com. Submit your topic, and you never know, it might just become the next episode of Brickology. And before I go, remember guys, stay safe. Stay clean, stay distance from most people. Let's beat this virus together. And if you are being affected by it, please let me know and I will be praying for you. Thank you so much for listening today. Also, while you're at it, please go subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, like my Facebook page. And if you really love the show and you really love Lego Lee, maybe consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Every small little donation, even a dollar a month, goes a long way for more awesome content like this to come out. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Brickologies. I will see you guys next week with whatever my topic is, TBD. I'll see you guys later. Peace out. Bye-bye.